A Pregnant Woman on Life Support by Kelsey Hansen, Jenna Bible, and Deanne Moore. In November of 2013, Eric Munoz awoke to find his 33-year-old wife, Marlise, unresponsive on their kitchen floor. Marlise Munoz was 14 weeks pregnant with her second child. She suffered a fatal pulmonary embolism that resulted in a significant anoxic brain injury that led physicians to declare her brain dead just days later. Physicians at John Peter Smith Hospital kept her on life support, citing Texas law that prohibits withholding life-sustaining treatment from pregnant women. Under normal circumstances, the family of a patient can enact an advanced directive to answer these difficult ethical questions and return autonomy to the patient for such decisions. However, current Texas legislation prohibits physicians from honoring advanced directives while a patient is pregnant. In this presentation, we will discuss the legal and ethical challenges surrounding maternal and fetal rights in Texas. The family had experience with traumatic injury and death. It was a topic they discussed prior to Marlise's incident. Eric worked as a firefighter and currently holds a paramedic and EMT instructor's license. Marlise worked as a paramedic in Tarrant County. Marlise's father was a retired police officer. Mr. Munoz and Marlise's parents agreed that despite her current pregnancy, she would not have wanted to remain on life support after her brain death. The parents of Marlise Munoz have since spoken out about how this experience delayed grieving and prolonged their agony in an already terrible situation. Marlise Munoz, a pregnant brain dead woman, was kept on life support for two months despite family's wishes. The patient suffered a severe pulmonary embolism and met clinical criteria for brain death two days after admission. Upon examination by lawyers, medical records indicated that some physicians had recommended the withdrawal of life support. Texas law prohibits medical officials from cutting off life support to a pregnant woman. The patient was 14 weeks pregnant upon admission and continued to be mechanically ventilated until 22 weeks of pregnancy. Records stated that the fetus had major congenital malformations. It suffered from hydrocephalus as well as a possible heart problem and deformed lower extremities. After two months of life-sustaining measures, the judge ruled that the state law barring doctors from withdrawing life-sustaining treatment to pregnant women did not apply to this patient because she was brain dead and therefore legally dead. This case raises several concerns about whether the Texas law allows medical professionals to treat patients ethically. Does the patient's right to autonomy end during pregnancy? Should specifics about the fetus, such as gestational age and viability, congenital malformation, or the likelihood of survival after delivery be considered when deciding to withdraw life support? Does a patient or her surrogates have a right to end life support if it would mean death for the fetus? Was Marlise Munoz clinically dead when she was on life support? The four main concepts that guide American bioethics are autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. The American Nurses Association Code of Ethics for Nurses with Interpretive Statements addresses these concepts in detail. Section 1.4 states, Patients have the moral and legal right to determine what will be done with and to their own person, to be given accurate, complete, and understandable information in a manner that facilitates an informed decision, and to be assisted with weighing the benefits, burdens, and available options in their treatment, including the choice of no treatment. The spouse and family maintains that Marlise did not want to remain on life support after brain death. In Eric's affidavit to the court, he wrote to ask a judge to force the hospital to stop mechanical ventilation. Marlise was very clear to me and very clear to her parents. Marlise did not want to be kept on life-sustaining measures. There is nothing that can possibly sustain my wife's life. Instead, Marlise's parents and I have continually watched John Peter Smith Hospital provide medical treatment to my wife's corpse against our instruction and request. This can be the cause of a moral dilemma for the nurse. The nurse may be compelled to uphold the patient's right to autonomy. However, hospital administration and attorneys maintain that state law overrides the patient's right to autonomy in these circumstances. This ties the hands of the nurse. The other ethical concepts to consider when having a discussion about the ethics are beneficence and non-maleficence. Western states 
Beneficence is the expectation of the patient that the nurse will do good and prevent harm to the patient. And non-maleficence is to protect the patient from harmful circumstances or decisions and to promote, not ignore, treatments that will not harm and forbid those that will cause harm. Court documents from Eric Munoz and Marlise's parents' account of her state after admission describe contractures, skin changes, and Eric specifically mentions a soulless look in her eyes. In addition, some news reports state that the fetus has malformations significant enough to make determining the sex by ultrasound impossible and suggesting the possibility of hydrocephalus and congenital heart malformations. If the treatment is causing harm to the patient, beneficence and non-maleficence has not been maintained. This is another example of how the situation might confer moral uncertainty for the nurses caring for Mrs. Munoz. Finally, Westrick says that the nurse's moral obligation is to treat all people fairly. The nurse must consider the concept of treating everyone fairly and ensuring justice for all. The 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution guarantees that no state can deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. This can cause moral conflict for nurses in two opposing ways. If the nurse considers that the fetus is a living being separate from the dead mother, then it can be argued that the fetus has a right to life under this constitutional amendment. At the same time, those supporting Marlise's right to be removed from the ventilator can argue that she was not given the same rights under equal protection of the laws. The landmark case Roe v. Wade decided the degree of the rights of the fetus based on viability, with the only exception being in cases where continuing the pregnancy poses a threat to the mother's life. In 2000, the Supreme Court reaffirmed this ruling in Sternberg v. Carhart. The Supreme Court also has determined that an unborn fetus is not a person using the 14th Amendment. So how does the court determine when to honor the mother or save the fetus? According to Westrick, the courts have often upheld decisions with opposing viewpoints. Attorneys for Eric Munoz argued that the 14th Amendment protected Marlise's right to autonomy because every American citizen should be given equal protection of the laws. That would mean that the state of Texas could not enact a law that specified different criteria for pregnant and non-pregnant women. The 96th Judicial Court offered no ruling on the constitutional challenges of Section 166.049 of the Texas Advanced Directive Act. Texas has passed laws in the past that restrict the rights of pregnant women. In Texas, a pregnant woman loses her right to an advanced directive. Physicians are unable to withdraw life support to a pregnant patient unless she has been declared legally dead. Section 166.049 of the Texas Advanced Directive Act states, a person may not withdraw or withhold life-sustaining treatment under this subchapter from a pregnant client. Additionally, Section 166.098 extends the restriction on advanced directives stating, a person may not withhold cardiopulmonary resuscitation or certain other life-sustaining treatment designated by the board under this subchapter from a person known by the responding healthcare professionals to be pregnant. The mother maintains her rights except when certain circumstances arise. There are select situations in which a mother's rights may be diminished. These include requesting a DNR order, refusing a blood transfusion, emergency admission during labor or acute illness and where the four stringent conditions are met prior to court intervention. Before the decision is made to involve the judicial system, four conditions must be present. One, there is a high probability that the fetus will suffer serious harm if the patient's refusal is honored. Two, there is a high probability that the treatment will prevent or substantially reduce harm to the fetus. Three, there are no comparable treatment options available. And four, there is a high probability that the treatment will also benefit the mother or that risks to her are minimal. Unless these four conditions are met, the woman's right to autonomy risks being violated with the use of judicial authority. In Texas, the law states that physicians cannot withdraw life support from a pregnant patient unless the patient is legally dead. In Marlise Munoz's case, she was ruled brain dead but still remained on life support against her family's will until two months later when a judge decided that since she was declared brain dead, she was also legally dead. Marlise's family was forced to undergo two months of this traumatization. 
The fetus also suffered several defects, inc including hydrocephalus, deformed lower extremities, and a congenital heart problem. This Texas law poses significant problems in nursing practice regarding autonomy, a patient's right to choose, beneficence, a nurse's responsibility to do good for the patient, non-maleficence, a nurse's responsibility to do no harm, and justice, a patient's right to be treated equally. This law ignores the rights of the mother and family and forces pregnant women to receive treatment that they and their families refuse in situations where it is likely the fetus will be harmed if treatment is refused, if the treatment may prevent harm to the fetus, no other treatment options are available, or that the treatment may benefit the mother or that the risks to her are minimal.